Hello, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host for Montessori, Creativity, and the Meaning of Life. You can find all the work that I do on my links on Instagram. I have two accounts over there, uh, under at Robin underscore Norgren, or at UBU, the number four, life. I'd like to first start with some words from Chris Gillibo from his book, The Happiness of Pursuit. When Sandy talked about the moment she decided to put the job search on hold and pursue a big adventure, she described it as the sense of being at the reins of my life. She was taking control as part of a broader life mission to reinvent herself. Twelve years had gone by at GM, and Sandy realized if the change hadn't come along, another dozen years might pass in the same circumstances. I had zero clue how to do it, she told me, when we met up in Toronto, but I was driven by the desire to avoid looking back years later and calling myself a chicken shit for not using this opportunity for something. She began the journey as a project of self-discovery and documentation, but the biggest surprise was a new career. Upon returning to her native Canada, she began receiving offers to speak and submit her photography to major exhibitions. One of her photos landed on the cover of a prominent art magazine. At the same time, she pursued a new opportunity as a tour guide, leading groups throughout the maritime provinces where she'd grown up. The opportunity allowed her to work part-time during the best season of the year for touring, and still provided plenty of time to pursue her art and travels. Sandy's reinvention had come full circle in a totally different way than expected. Looking back now, she feels only satisfaction in making the U-turn to pursue a quest instead of immediately looking for another job. We get one ride in life, she says. I'm so glad I did this. Whether you're trying to decide on your next steps, filtering out dissenting voices, or just nudging yourself along a set course, it helps to consult your internal compass. Consider these questions for Self-Reflection 101. How am I feeling? Your final decision may not be based entirely on feelings, but feelings can be a good overall temperature check. What makes you happy and what makes you sad? Are you eager to make progress or are you deferring the next part of the task? What do I want really? In my case, I often want to get things done and move ahead on projects. In those cases, the answer to my what do I want question involves making a list of what I hope to accomplish. I base this list on the two or three most important projects on my mind that day. And I know that if I can complete them or at least make good progress during the day, I'll feel better later. Sometimes I want something completely different and by thinking about these questions I may realize that I don't feel very productive. I may need to rest or exercise or just go to the coffee shop to read for the afternoon. What is my identity? Who are you? What do you want to do ultimately? Your identity shapes everything about you. How you spend your time, your work, your priorities, and everything else. If you already have a good idea of who you are, take the time to remind yourself of that image as you plan next steps. If you can focus on what's important to you in the midst of bad news, That image brings you comfort. You know you're doing something right. Can I change the terms of this situation? There are two types of challenges. Those where you can take action to remedy the situation and those where you're relatively powerless. It's always good to know which kind of challenge you're facing. If you can influence the situation for the better, You can then make a plan for change. If you can't, 
then you can move to a plan for acceptance of the bad news. You won't always have the answers to everything. But when you follow the path indicated by your inner compass, you can deal with the external challenges as they come. From Judith Kuhn's book, The Burning Word. The Bible records that at the end of his long life, Moses angered God, who declared that he would not allow the prophet to enter into the promised land he had spent 40 years toiling toward. Instead, just at the border of the land of milk and honey, Moses dies. Midrashic literature is fascinated by the seeming rupture of a relationship considered in Judaism to be more intimate than any other in history. One legend says that when the great prophet dies, he's taken up to heaven. Then he sees God in his study, hunched over a table with a Torah scroll spread open upon it. God is using inks and brushes to add all kinds of dots and ornaments to the texts. Why are you doing that, Moses asks, ever daring to give voice to his curiosity. Without looking up from his work, God tells them, In the future, a rabbi named Akiva will arise who is so brilliant he can fathom every mystery of the Torah. I am making his job harder for him. What do you mean, Moses asks. And for answer, he is immediately transported forward in a time to a classroom where Rabbi Akiva is teaching on Torah, Moses. Standing in the back of the classroom, Moses is bewildered. He doesn't understand a word the sage is saying. Then a student raises his hand and asks, Where does that teaching come from, Rabbi? And Rabbi Akiva replies, It comes from Moshe Rebenu, the master teacher. Immediately, Moses is transported back to the study room where God is still working. It is strange to contemplate that this man who carries everything ever said about Torah in his head still has questions, remains bewildered. But clearly, God is no longer hiding from him. If he seems indifferent, he also seems present. Perhaps one lesson we draw from this story is that no matter how close we feel to God, no matter how much knowledge we have mastered, the questions never end. Another lesson is that God is not so much hiding from us as he is hiding for us. He is purposefully creating the places where with curiosity and perseverance we can find him. The Jewish tradition deliberately encourages its youth to develop such an attitude of fearless seeking through Misratic texts like the annual Passover, Hadagah. During the ritual Seder meal, each child in a family is obliged to ask four traditional questions after being told that there are four possible attitudes to take. That of the wise son who knows the question and asks it that of the wicked son, who knows the question but refuses to ask it. That of the simple son, who knows the question but it is indifferent in it. That of the ignorant son, who does not know the question and therefore is unable to ask. Though the Passover ceremony contains answers to the four traditional questions, the emphasis is on seeking rather than finding. The definitive, celebrated beginning of a Jewish child's religious life is not the first expression of belief, but the first genuinely expressed question. To practice Midrash is to search out the questions, all of them, knowing that at any point our questions may pull us into a place where divine mystery dwells. I am learning that the ground of scripture is our ground, and at the same time, it is holy ground. We are invited by God to till its soil, though we do so at the risk of being changed and of being charged. Midrash requires both the reverence that causes Moses to hide his face and the chuspa that frees him to ask everything of God 
even as God asks everything of him. From the War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. Resistance and unhappiness. What does resistance feel like? First, unhappiness. We feel like hell. A low-grade misery pervades everything. We're bored. We're restless. We can't get no satisfaction. There's guilt, but we can't put our finger on the source. We want to go back to bed. We want to get up and party. We feel unloved and unlovable. We're disgusted. We hate our lives. We hate ourselves. Unalleviated, resistance mounts to a pitch that becomes unendurable. At this point, vices kick in. Dope, adultery, web surfing. Beyond that, resistance becomes clinical. Depression, aggression, dysfunction. Then actual crime and physical self-destruction. Sounds like life, I know. It isn't. It's resistance. What makes it tricky is that we live in a consumer culture that's acutely aware of this unhappiness and has massed all its profit-seeking artillery to exploit it. By selling us a product, a drug, a distraction. John Lennon once wrote, Well, you think you're so clever and classless and free, but you're all fucking peasants as far as I can see. As artists and professionals, it is our obligation to enact our own internal revolution, a private insurrection inside our own skulls. In this uprising, we're, we free ourselves from the tyranny of consumer culture. We overthrow the programming of advertising, movies, video games, magazines, TV, by which become, we become hypnotized from the cradle. We unplug ourselves from the grid by recognizing that we will never cure our restlessness by contributing our disposable income to the bottom line of bullshit, but only by doing our work. <laughs>